the meeting begins. The board is gathered around the table with the recent financial statement staring them in the face. In the past six months, the company has been taking a terrible hit from competitors. The marketing division looks at the production division who looks at the design team. Even they look at the chair of the board. Everyone is wondering what is next. The chair of the board guides them through an analysis of the situation and they begin to strategize their options. Suddenly the door opens and in walks a junior executive who had accidentally left her coffee mug in the boardroom the day before and she didn't know that they were having a meeting. She paused and sheepishly began to walk out of the room when the chair of the board said, no, stay. We would love to have some fresh ideas. The meeting continues. The junior executive is so impressed by this team of strategists, so much wisdom, so much knowledge, she gets excited that she is part of the team. And even though she feels inadequate to the task of helping turn around the company, she believes in the product. She has a vision of what can be. And so when the chair asks, who will represent us to the public? Whom shall I send? Her hand goes up and she says, here am I, send me. It's 742 B.C., and in a vision, Isaiah happens to stumble upon a strategy meeting. God is with the heavenly court trying to decide how to get human beings to listen. The Lord is disgusted with our lack of social justice. The Lord is tired of the disobedience of humans. The Lord is looking for a fresh new way to get them to listen and to grasp the divine desire for righteousness and obedience and faithfulness. And so God says, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah jumps up and says, here am I. Send me. This morning's text is from the book of Isaiah. This particular portion of the Old Testament prophecy comes in two parts. We often refer to verse, chapters 1 through 39 as 1st Isaiah, and then from chapter 40 to the end as Deutero-Isaiah, or 2nd Isaiah. But 1st Isaiah includes Isaiah's prophesying to Judah and Jerusalem between 742 and 701 B.C. This is the pre-exilic period for the kingdom of Judah. In 721 B.C., the kingdom of Israel has been taken off into exile, and Judah is not far behind it. Because God is tired of the sins of the people. They're, they are such a disappointment to God. God is wrestling with what should be done. So at a board meeting of the heavenly hosts, Isaiah has this vision. In fact, the meeting occurs within the setting of the temple. Isaiah has this marvelous moment of worship when he says, I saw the Lord. The experience is so intense that he immediately lowers his eyes from looking up at the mighty throne and he describes the clothing that God is wearing. He's just afraid to lift his eyes upwards. And he talks about the heavenly creatures, the seraphs that are surrounding the throne. It's too much for Isaiah to begin to describe the Lord. And the moment is so humbling that he realizes how unworthy he is. He says, woe is me, for I am lost, I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips and yet even still my eyes have been allowed to see the Lord, the ho Lord of hosts. Throughout the Old Testament, tradition had it that if one actually looked at the Lord, one would immediately die. It would be too awesome of an experience for the human heart to be able to handle, but here in the temple, Isaiah is granted the privilege of seeing God and living to tell about it. As Isaiah is consumed by his unworthiness, a heavenly being comes and touches his lips with a burning coal. I was teaching a confirmation class this text several years ago, and one of the and with that vision of the burning coal touching the lips, one of the students said, "Sometimes forgiveness is painful." out of the mouth of 7th and 8th graders. Good, good. 
That is because we know that we have done wrong and we stand ready to be judged for it. But when we ask God to forgive, God is ready to do it, to cleanse us from all wrong. The, the Presbyterian Church USA has the Blue Cross Blue Shield plan for pastors and their families. And in that plan, we are supposed to take a, complete an assessment and a call to health and get uh, build up to a thousand points and it decreases our deductible the next year so I've been working on my call to health this week and trying to get to a thousand points and one of the points where I, I gained 25 points in my call to health was a section called practice forgiveness and so that's pretty awesome so I took the words off of the site this is from the, the Board of Pensions Research shows that forgiveness is good for our health, relationships, and communities. And because God wants us to love our neighbors, we need to know how to truly forgive. Being in relationship with others sometimes means experiencing hurt or taking offense. But holding on to the experience is not good for your mental or your physical health. It can lead to anger, anxiety, and depression which can elevate stress, increase your blood pressure, and even compromise your immune system. Psychologists define forgiveness as a deliberate decision to release negative feelings towards a person who has offended you, regardless of whether they deserve forgiveness. The forgiver makes a conscious choice to forgive. Experts make clear that forgiving is not about minimizing the seriousness of an offense, nor does it mean excusing offenses. Rather, it's a healing experience to improve your well-being. It does not require you to reconcile with the person you are forgiving, although it may make reconciliation possible. Forgiving others takes time and practice. So here are some research-based strategies for tapping into your capacity to forgive using both your heart and your head. First, allow yourself to fully see how you've been offended. Don't minimize it. Second, when ready, set the intention to forgive. Third, understand that your sense of grievance is distinct from the original offense and that it's your choice to continue to hold on to or to let go. Fourth, choose compassion. Remembering your common humanity makes it easier to let go of resentment. Number five, look for the love, beauty, and kindness around you. Notice and appreciate what you have rather than what you don't have. And then it concludes, did you know? Wild animals forgive too. Apes, goats, dolphins, and hyenas all tend to reconcile after conflicts by rubbing horns, flippers, or fur, typical conciliatory gestures. So my takeaway is, if apes and hyenas can do it, then I can earn those 25 points. <laughs> because I have to think back to the last three weeks and think of three instances where I felt offended, where I needed to ask for forgiveness. And... Um, I could remember many more than three. But it's very important that we realize that Isaiah's forgiveness experience was very tangible. God took a burning coal and it, was, it touched his lips. And in that moment of the touch, he is set free from brokenness. This makes me wonder if the same can happen with the bread and with the cup. When we let the bread touch our lips, when we allow the cup, to touch our lips, is it at that moment that God will cleanse us from something that has been broken? Do we ever feel unworthy as we come to the Lord's table? Do we marvel at how much God loves us by sending Jesus to die for us? Can you or I ever do enough to deserve God's love? This table represents God's amazing grace. Cleansed by God, Isaiah listens as God's strategy develops I need someone, God says, who will go and speak my word to the people. Who will it be? And without a moment's hesitation, Isaiah raises his hand boldly. Here I am. Send me. 
That begins a long and risky ministry of delivering God's prophetic word to a people who do not want to hear it. But Isaiah remains faithful to that call. This is a great story, but what does it mean for you and me? How are we supposed to be different tomorrow morning? Perhaps God is ready to cleanse you this morning as the bread and as the cup touch your lips. In that very moment as you experience the body of Christ broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you, be open to God's cleansing power. Perhaps, perhaps the Lord wants to allow us to catch a glimpse, a small glimpse of God's essence through the eyes of our hearts this morning and perhaps Seeing the Lord leads to serving the Lord. Perhaps, you know, perhaps God is leading us into a whole new area of ministry and we've been struggling with it. Now we know God is calling, here I am, send me. When Laura and I were serving at the Massanutten, at Massanutta Springs, she was ordained as a ruling elder at the Massanutten Presbyterian Church. And one Sunday, their director of music ministry got up and said, we need someone to direct our high school choir. And it was like I had the back of my shirt just pulled up. And I said, here I am. I was like, what did I just agree to do? <laughs> but we had a wonderful two years singing where guitar, piano, we got about eight of the youth guitarists together to play. It was a really beautiful year, and as if that wasn't enough, she was already a youth advisor for the senior highs, and I said, I'd love to do that too. So for the next several years, we were youth advisors. Here I am, use me. The nominating committee here at Grace Covenant has been working on four, to secure four deacons, and as of yesterday, a third person said yes. Several have had to say a holy no, and that is perfectly fine. Whenever you feel that God is leading you to realize that your schedule is too intense, a holy no is perfectly fine. But we have one more person to go, and be sure that, that you are praying for the nominating committee as we share this exciting ministry of compassion, witness, and service that happens through our deacons. Our chair of the deacons is right over there. David, raise your hand. And we have a deacons meeting right after church. If you want to know more about being a deacon, speak to David or to one of the, the, our current deacons. Other deacons, raise your hand so that we can see where you are. All right. It is a, it's a beautiful, beautiful ministry. So God's call often leads us out into our community with a mission. Grace Covenant provides opportunities for members to respond to God's call through Interfaith Hospitality Network through Safe Home and Johnson County Christmas Bureau and the Duchesne Clinic and the Red Bag Christmas and Crop Walk, sometimes the call is local and sometimes it's national. For Isaiah, his national ministry to the kingdom of Judah from 742 to 701 B.C. was in an area that is seven times the size of Johnson County. He spent that entire life ministering in that community. That's national. His ministry was national. But sometimes the call of God takes us far away, like we heard from Jeff and Christy Boyd, what we hear from Leslie Vogel, persons in the Congo, in Guatemala, um, in Kenya, in Rwanda, where Luke McCammon is. God said, go and make disciples of all nations. So on this World Communion Sunday, we think of those who have said, here I am, send me. We think of those whose call has sent them far beyond our national shores. And we praise God for persons who have come from other countries here. The Kong and Kwan family, it's such a blessing to have them among us. To have David Chioka from Kenya who serves as the Nema Community Church pastor in Olathe. He said, here I am, Lord, when people began to seek a Swahili English worship experience. And so at the Nema Church, if you're on vacation at some point and you want to take a little break, don't go very often away from Grace Covenant, but David Chioka is amazing, and you ought to go find the Nema Church in Olathe. They have programs throughout the week as well. They serve, and they serve, and they serve in Christ's name, and David tells us what a blessing it is to be an immigrant who is loved with, the Christ, with Christ's love and feels welcome in this community. Men and women, youth and children, millions upon millions have heard God's question, Whom shall I send? And have responded, Here I am, send me. 
That is God's strategy, to call, to cleanse, and to send us into all the world, beginning in our own backyard, to bring the gospel of peace, forgiveness, and love. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, help us to answer the call. Help us to be a world community, caring for our neighbors, our sisters and brothers, wherever they may be on this planet. In Christ we pray. Amen.